So good morning, everyone. Lizzie and I are here again. It's nine o'clock on a Sunday morning in London, and we are uh, really thrilled to be doing this for the third week and absolutely delighted uh, that you're able to join us either <clears throat> watching live, as we know that some of you have been doing, or uh, many people have been saying that they've uh, been catching up later on, which works just as well. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be together again, as we have been for the last couple of weeks, for half an hour. And um, we've picked something this morning, which uh, I wrote some time ago, that came back into my orbit this last week. I was uh, teaching a class, um, one of our coaching courses this last week, and somebody in the class said how much this piece had moved them. And that's what brought it back to my attention. So here it is. So we'll take that up in a moment. But I'm going to hand over to Lizzie. It'd be so nice to hear what you have to say, Lizzie. So I'm going to um, I'm going to read Justin's wonderful source. I'm um, as you may have seen, I'm taking real joy in I, I read Justin's blog and it comes to my email every day. But which, by the way, if you don't have already, you can um, sign up to receive into your email box rather than have to go somewhere to find it if you wanted to. Um, and I'm noticing that doing this, I'm getting to really reflect on them in a different way. And I'm really appreciating that and finding myself wanting to make little pictures that I'm making of Justin's words and having experienced the feeling as well, Justin, of last week, you reading my words, I'm kind of um, wanting to kind of enhance the gift, if I can, of other people saying things that are yours and making things out of things that are yours so that you can feel the dignity in that and the um yeah the experience of having something made from what you made feels like a really important part of this too um so i'm going to read the source for us all today <clears throat> and if you um if you want to see the source for yourself we posted it in the the um the discussion board so that you can click on it and um read it and share it and reflect on it yourselves but i'm going to read it for us now the hidden cost of hiding. It's easy for us to hide in plain sight. We hide in our busyness and in our distraction. We hide by saying only part of what's true and withholding the rest. We hide by leaving parts of us out, our courage, our vulnerability, our truthfulness. We hide by throwing ourselves into our work and thereby saving ourselves from showing up outside it. And we hide by throwing ourselves away from our work and saving ourselves from showing up within it. We hide in our addictions, in numbing ourselves and scrolling the Facebook feed. We hide in pretending to be happy when inside we're crying. We hide in our self-importance and in overdoing our smallness. We hide behind rules and regulation, policy and procedure. And we hide in meetings through our silence and compliance. We hide by shutting down our hearts in the face of the suffering of others. We hide by stifling our ideas and holding back what only we can say. We hide in our pursuit of money and status. We hide ourselves in looking good and avoiding shame. And we hide by refusing to ask for help when we need it. And every moment of our hiding robs us and the world of wonders that only we can bring from seeing that only we can see, and from words, perhaps the most necessary words that only we can say. It's lovely to hear you read it, Lizzie. It's amazing. Uh, one of the things that immediately strikes me is how <clears throat> the, the words that we bring when we're prepared to bring them stop being ours once they're out in the world. So yes, there was a me that wrote this some weeks ago. And, and the me that I am is now not that person, but a different person. And it came out of a particular sense of, set of circumstances and it's different to hear it back. Mm. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering what strikes you about this? What's occurring to you first about this topic? Do you know, I am... Um... 
I'm struck with a comment that in the week that you told me about that there's somebody watching our videos that was um, asking about the world of work and how there's a way that, I think the question was wondering about how we are including that and how in our worlds um, we speak of that. And the bit that really got me just this time when I read it, and it's different every time because I've read it a few times, um, is the part where we say we hide, we hide by throwing ourselves into our work and thereby saving ourselves from showing up outside of it. And I can feel that there's ways that, you know, we all have these kind of roles that we go into. Um, work being just one, you know, roles as a, you know, what a, what a, what being a father means or roles as a, what, what's, what being a wife means or what being a good colleague means, which are all, you know, informed in so many ways by the kind of background culture and upbringing that we had of what's the right way to be and the wrong way to be. And how my sense is that, you know, we do this so much because we're trying to save ourselves from this excruciating shame of being something that's not acceptable in the world. Um, and, and, and absolutely that happens at work. And I, and I think just in the, the topic we were talking about with the, with the person who commented about the work environment is that there was a link into community and togetherness that gets brought about through working with one another. And I'm really glad to say that like in third space, I really feel that, you know, I really feel the community of us and the community of this right now is you and I communing feels like it opens up a space to be looser about our roles, be looser about what we think is expected of one another and actually be really clear with, with, with one another about what's expected of us rather than taking on some imagined expectation and then trying to live into that. And then when we fail, we don't have to be um it's like there's a paradigm of there's all these things to live up to and when I don't live up to those imagined things I experience shame and part of it is I don't even know what those things are anyway I'm just trying my best to kind of dance to the tune of whatever the tune is that I think is playing because of how everybody looks at me and how I feel around in certain environments and in my imagined worlds of how I should be um and I love the fact that you also put next to that too, that we hide by throwing ourselves away from our work by saying and saving ourselves from showing up within it. It's like both of those things, are like the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yet there's um, a big invitation there of whether you're in it or, and, 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 and shying away or you're totally consumed in it as a, as a means of protecting ourselves and, um, thinking that that's who we are so I don't know that seems like a kind of huge thing to say at the beginning lots of words that I'm just coming up with um but I'm just really enjoying that aspect of what you're bringing about the work part mm. so um, it's a question which feels really important to me um and I know has been very important in the work that we're doing in third space and also in the coaching practices that we have with our clients as well and I think it's important because um, there's a way in which work has become as far as I can tell the dominant um, central feature of our society is everything in some way seems to be about work which makes sense right in one way it makes total sense because most of us need to work in order to take care of things like having a place to live or having food to eat and having opportunities that we want to take up. But it, it's important because there's a way in which um, our culture has made that the central thing, like to be a human being is first of all, to be a worker or maybe first of all, to be a consumer, but second of all, to be a worker so that you can be a consumer. So it's a really important topic for us. And the, tragedy of it seems to me which you're pointing to and what you're saying is that um work which could be and ought to be a way that we get to bring ourselves a way that we get to express the extraordinary talents 
for creativity and for connection and for generosity and for doing things that will make a difference to people mm. for contributing has for so many people become exactly the opposite it's um it's where we hide it's where we feel like we have no option but to hide and that to come out of hiding would be in, and in some situations is because of the way the whole thing is set up an incredible risk maybe i'll get thrown out maybe i won't get go, won't get liked and um like you're saying it has both of these sides to it so many of us find ourselves hiding inside our work um narrowing ourselves so much you know I, i'll say one thing about that because i want to say something about the other side but it's at some point as we go but um one of the great tragedies it seems to me is how many people and this is where one of the lines in this came from how many people i make i meet say things like well i spend so much time in my work doing things which are pointless mm. like being in meetings with people where we all know that we ought not to be there and that nobody really wants to be there but we're all mm -hmm. playing the game of going along with the thing and that's just what we do mm. and when i hear people say that i i think this is a tragedy i mean a real tragedy for all of us that there is such possibility that's being stifled and held back and we're afraid to do anything about it yeah and the, here's the really sad thing is that very often the people who are the most afraid mm. to do anything about it are people who actually have the power to do something about it mm. You know, are people who have hierarchical power in an organization who could really change something. And that's where the hiding part of it comes in. Because that's not when someone else is saying, well, you'll, you know, if you, you'll lose your job or something. It's more like, am I prepared to take the risk mm -hmm. to say what I really think and feel what I really feel and be human? So this is the, this correspondence we had from someone who'd been watching our videos about community and that you're mm -hmm. talking about to be human with somebody else in work and take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. And it's as you're talking, Justin, I'm thinking, I think, I think it was something that um, might be a Steiner thing or I'm not sure, but it's really stuck with me that um, there's this, I don't know if it's a phrase or a teaching about work is our love made manifest. It's um, Khalil Gibran. It's the prophet. Ah, yeah. Work is love made manifest. It's so beautiful. It really gets me when I think of that. And I'm thinking right now of that line and how I know it's really helped me to make the distinctions around to have that as my definition of what work is and to know when I'm not even working and how important work is to a human being. Mm. Like the dignity of work feels so important to a life. And when work doesn't feel like it's my love made manifest, what questions do I need to be asking myself? And of course, love comes in like hundreds of thousands of shapes and sizes and feelings and experiences. Um, but the thing that you're talking about where we sit in places and actually hide in plain sight which is what you you know the words that you use it strikes me that there's a way that our common culture doesn't really ask these questions and we sit there thinking something's horribly wrong here but we don't have like a narrative or a way out or a language to articulate that feeling and therefore have awareness about it and do something to reveal ourselves and to be and to feel real and to become real and it's a real undoing for me to have this possibility that my work is my love made manifest i'm pretty sure that like in my mainstream education there was no call to this there was no somebody standing on the side saying it's okay you know you don't um you don't have to just follow the 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 path that seems to be set before you there's there's a different way of defining what human life is and what work means. So it's really deep, like all these people that we go through in our education and wholly trust 
and so much of our system doesn't attend to how to be in the world and how to feel dignified with our contribution and how to make our love may manifest how to even ask into what my love is my particular flavor of love and then make it manifest and call it my work and feel it as my work and experience it as my work and be met with it being experienced by others as my work and I think this is one of the reasons why I'm just enjoying this with you Justin because it's like these conversations and this curiosity that you and I share and I know that many of others the other folks in our community and in third space are the same way it feels so dignifying to be in these conversations and to be giving voice to these huge impetuses to know something true and real and to feel real as well Mm. It's really something that you're bringing love into the center of this. And um, yes, so much of, I think the kind of coaching that we end up doing, you and I, and that we end up teaching in third space has this at the heart of it, which is a, a deeply unfashionable stand, <laughs> which is that um, human, <laughs> human beings are love. and this connection you're making between work and love which seems so um what's so interesting about it in so much of our culture is how uh, how quickly that's dismissed so work of course is many things but one thing it can be like you're saying is a deeply dignified bringing of ourselves to the world and somehow we also get into a misunderstanding that For love to be part of work, it means somehow I have to have the most exciting work in the world. I have to be, the work will be love when I travel to sunny, exotic places and do glamorous things. But work can be love when we make tables or paint walls Mm. or teach other people or or, or, um, do things that, smooth the flow of other people's contributions so the administrative work of an organization can be love too for sure but we've completely taken that out of our understanding of what work might be and and then we end up hiding of course we end up um hiding the possibility that work could be anything else yeah and one of the people i know you know that i love his work Lizzie Seth Godin, who mm. has this amazing book called The Icarus Deception. Oh, yeah. And in The Icarus Deception, he, he says, um, it's really important for us to see where this got started, because it hasn't always been this way. And I, I really appreciate him saying this, that there's only 200 years ago or so when the Industrial Revolution got started, when some very powerful and influential people rewrote what work would be to say work is about abandoning yourself so that you can fit into something and you can become and to become economically useful is to abandon yourself yeah and if you are diligent at abandoning yourself and do everything that you're told everything will work out well for you and one day when you retire you will get to stop abandoning yourself and then you can do things that you love or you can bring yourself in love and how about the alternative is we find a way to cultivate a fierce kind of love for the world Mm. bring ourselves that way which isn't the same as doing things that we like that's the other thing mm-hmm. you have to be doing something you like to bring us to dedicate yourself the love that you are as a human being to dedicate that self to your work but you do have to be doing things that are meaningful yeah. that contribute there are that are a gift to people so of course there's all kinds of um as I'm saying this, I'm thinking there are all kinds of systemic societal things which make this hard for people. So I don't want to be um, yeah. like simplistic yeah. about it, but at the same time, so many people who do have some kind of choice in this, we're choosing mm-hmm. to continue to hide ourselves fearfully in the midst of our work and not even asking ourselves this question, which is what would it be to really bring myself here? Yeah. Yeah. And also it makes me think of those who aren't like 
working people in the definition that you just brought, which is to make yourself economically viable. And how, you know, I remember my sister saying to me, oh, when people ask me what I do, I just kind of cringe. And, you know, when she first became a mum and to say that I'm a mum was so unsatisfying for people. Like if she was sitting next to somebody at a wedding and they'd say, what do you do? And she said, I'm a mum. And they were like, mm, that's the end of that conversation then. And there's a kind of common, um, I think that narrative's really deep within us that if we're not economically productive, that somehow our value or our worth is determined by that conversation in the world. And it strikes me as well that it's, it's really unfashionable, as you say, to, um, to not be economically viable. Like that there's, there's some deep attachment to the economics and the resource part of being a human being um, that perpetuates the way we hide ourselves because we know that that narrative exists. We know that that's there. It's really shameful for us to say, um, you know, I've messed up in some kind of economic way. Even, you know, if I'm not earning what I think I should be earning because of what the world says I should be earning or, um, I've messed up in some kind of financial way. I've, I've experienced recently some like real shame around finances and like nobody talks about it. And so I felt myself feeling, having to feel really safe with the people that I want to talk about it with because it, it feels so vulnerable to expose myself in the way to do with my finances. And even now, as I speak about it, I'm like, oh my goodness, that really determines like whether I'm a good person or not. I can feel it, like the shame is right here. And there's those of, in my community and my family who remind me that that's not what determines my worth in the world and my value as a human being. And yet it's so, even the word value, like when I even say the word value, there's money coming out of that word. Like it's, it's really interesting. And these narratives are so embedded in our language and in our conversations and in the way we feel we can be revealing. Um, I met this lady actually at a wedding the other day who runs this charity that is trying to address the issue that there is a, a very, very strong link between financial um, difficulty and mental health. And it really struck me that it's such a vulnerable place in us that's got so much shame involved in it that it you know it perpetuates itself it's like I, I mess something up with my finances I feel shame it determines so much about my self-esteem and who I am as a person that you know I have to hide like I have to I have to keep myself away from the world because I'm so excruciatingly ashamed of the situation I find myself in and um, a little bit like the comment that I think it was Cynthia was making that her uncle's hus her husband's uncle used to go to work every day, even when there was no work to go to. I think it's in the same realm as that, mm -hmm. is that there are so many narratives in our culture that mean we have to hide because if we don't, we feel the searing pain of not being accepted and acceptable to our community. And it has that deep root of survival in there which is that if I'm not accepted by my community, if I'm not seen in the right way, I would be outcast and I would die. You know, it has those, those kind of animal origins in it too. I think that's a big one, a big kind of, um, what do you call it? Like a facet of shame is that we really feel like we're going to die and we're going to be um, excluded in some way that threatens our very survival. so much every time you say something as we could spark <laughs> off onto another hole there's so much in what you're saying that the part that i'm that i've really um caught my attention in in so much that's beautiful and true that you're saying is the first part that you brought up which is where work so what we've been saying is that work and love rightly ought to be deeply connected with one another and where work becomes only economic activity so that those of us who anyone who has a work to do in the world mm. doesn't fit into that 
is also excluded and feels how quickly we feel ashamed. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, as you were saying it, I got thinking about something. The the school that my children go to has a head who I really admire, and he phrased this question in something that he wrote as you know as people start to think about what will I dedicate myself into the, to the world as I move out from school and into the world of work. And he asked people in the school to take on this question. He was saying, instead of asking, um, uh, what do I want to be? Like, what work do I want to do? Which, which very often becomes, what do I want to get? Like I'll be a, I'll be a, this kind of person. I'll get fame or I'll get money or I'll get self-esteem. He said a much better question, a more important question to ask is um, what contribution do I want to make to the world Mm. or what difficulty do I want to address through my work? I was so touched by that because when we start to think as an orientation for those of us who are growing up for the first time into the possibility of of work, but for any of us who do a work like bringing up children Mm -hmm. is a work or writing is a work Mm -hmm. or as a, you know, administering is a work, but for any of us who do it to ask the question, what's the gift that I'm bringing to the world? Mm. Now, imagine if, if when somebody said what kind of work you did, instead of having to justify ourselves economically or um, be able to say a role that will make sense, we could say, here's the difficulty in the world that I'm working on alleviating. Yeah. Or here's the possibility in the world that I'm working on bringing about. And, and that when we're in the connection that I'm making here is that, you know, this piece that we started to read, you read at the start, in part came from a realization of my own that there's ways in which I can h- hide from the world just by working. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm working. I'm working, working, working. But actually, <laughs> actually, what I'm doing is it's a profound act of hiding. It doesn't look yeah. like hiding and the way that it's hiding is that when I forget that what I'm doing is is working on making a contribution then I hide Mm -hmm. in my work and I get caught up in all of these narratives that you're talking about Lizzie Mm -hmm. about oh well it's about making money or it's about uh, making sense to people you know and of course it can be about both those but but much more deeply when I come out of hiding is when I am working on the contribution that's mine to make yeah and it's hard for all the reasons that you say, because it brings us into contact with them. Um, so one of the things that Seth Godin also says that I have really appreciated is the, mo- the times that we feel most afraid, they're probably the times we've actually stepped out of hiding. Yeah. That's the key. Oh, now <laughs> something's going to happen here. I'm, I'm kind of exposed. I might feel ashamed. I might not be liked. I might. Yeah. That's actually when I'm here, I'm present, I'm bringing myself. Which is a great reminder for me because I can easily get into um, trying not to feel afraid or trying not to feel ashamed. Mm. Both of which were a route into the kind of um, narrowness that we've been talking about. Yeah. It makes me think what an easy way out working is for me. Like I can say, oh, I'm really busy and I've got to go somewhere and I've got to do something. And, and I, I notice that it's really easy to use that as a kind of slippery way out of the thing that I actually really want to be doing as well like Mm. um you know so many times like my my sacred rebellion thing I've you know I haven't written on that for ages and then I have a little flurry and then I don't and I love it like I I actually read my own posts back and I think oh god thank god like that's really helpful to me in this moment and as you say it's like it takes on the quality of it not really being yours and even reading my journals back you know there's a way that that is is true as well and I think it's so easy to to be in the everyday in the everydayness of things and whatever the narratives of the everyday are like busyness and work and self-deprecation and criticism and you know, all those things that actually we, we spoke about before a little bit didn't we um it's so much easier to do that than to take the the opportunity that you're talking about justin of remembering remembering and remembering and remembering like what what is this really about what is my contribution 
and to have those spaces to even reflect on what my contribution is feels really crucial in this as well that mm. you, it's not kind of a given that you know what your contribution is I think it's not given that you've got an answer to that in any moment it's like for some of us like oh, I don't know I, I, I really don't know what I'm here for and what how to even address the kind of question of what possibility am, am I bringing about in the world and maybe that's another place like this is another reason why we are doing this too is for us and anyone else to find the space to reflect on and seek community in the question of what are, what what are we doing <laughs> which I never really know the answer to it's like really what what often I really do think I have absolutely no idea what's going on 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 a, on a level of actually what's really going on I, I obviously I can see what's going on like the the trees are blowing in the wind and we're on here together and on another level I really don't know what's going on at all so these spaces of reflection and finding a way to be with one another and talk about these things feels like a massive gift to me I think we're um into the conversation about what it is to wake up mm. and because when we wake up that's often when we realize how confused we are yeah so I'm, I'm using wake up and not in some um simplistic sense I mean paying attention when we really start to pay attention when we really start to let ourselves look and to feel we realize we don't know what we're doing <laughs> we don't really know what's going on and and that it seems to me is the moment of our deepest lostness in the middle of what we're doing is the moment that we have the chance to dedicate ourselves to something to make some choices yeah. and uh, this is none of this is easy um and in, in a way i also think lizzie that's what these conversations ha how these have got born is because of the dedication that we've had and that other people who are working around us and learning with us have had to say um none of this is easy so we have to help one another mm -hmm. there's not going to be some startling revelation that's going to come out of the blue that somehow takes away all difficulty and has life just all fall into place no it's mm -hmm. an ongoing actually here's the thing it's an ongoing work yeah that takes us pouring ourselves in with um as much love and courage as we can muster and coming out of hiding as much as we can and turning towards one another mm -hmm. so for those reasons i'm really glad we're doing this and super grateful this morning that other people are joining us in this that we don't just get to have these conversations you and i together but somehow mm -hmm. other people are in this alongside us it's really beautiful <sighs> well, I can see our time, Justin, and we've gone slightly over our half an hour that we've decided to do this for. Um, I'm just feeling really settled and grateful and in awe of the fact that as human beings, we have other human beings to be with us and to be in the conversation with us and how without that, it feels really hard. But with that, way more feels possible. Mm. thank you lizzie mm, thank you so i think we should say goodbye to everyone for this week and we'll be back on being well nine o'clock uk time next sunday morning and we'll see you then see you next week everybody thank Bye. you